So hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Shireen Ash. I'm a librarian at the Corte Madera Library, part of the Marin County Free Library System, and thrilled you all are here today. Um, I'm excited to have Shannon Burke come. She's a Marin County Park Interpretive Naturalist, very knowledgeable about um, the wildlife that we are privileged to live among. So um, yeah, I'm sure it'll be a really wonderful program. Just a couple housekeeping details. One is that we are recording this program. Um, and we'll have time for questions at the end. So please put your questions in the chat, stay mute the entire program, but I will read out your questions and Shannon will be able to answer them then. And a couple little bits of additional information in the chat, I'll be putting Shannon's email and the County Park email uh, website so that you can uh, learn about all the activities and events they're starting to do. Um, walks now. So that might be of interest. I'll put my email in the chat in case you have any questions for me about library programs or this program in particular. And in addition, there's a great new bird watching blog that a colleague of mine wrote on our website. So I'll let you know about that. So with that, I will disappear. I will see you uh, at the end of the program for questions and answers. Again, put them in the chat. You can put them in any time and I'll, I'll catch up with them at the end. All right. So thank you so much. And Shannon, it's all yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, I really wanted to thank uh, Corte Madera Library. It's always wonderful to partner with them on this and Shireen in particular um, just makes it so easy. Basically, all I have to do is um, just just show up and do this. So uh, welcome. And um, so I am the interpretive naturalist with Marin County Parks, and Marin County Parks manages uh, 34 different open space preserves that you can see here in green, and 39 different parks. And we offer uh, ranger events and volunteer days and um, naturalist walks that I do and, and lectures like this. So uh, you can check out our website, marincountyparks.org, to get more information and uh, go to the events column. So today we're going to talk about raptors of Marin. And um, I have to say, I, I have a particular fondness for raptors. Raptors were the first birds that I became interested in. Um, and so I, I still have that affection for them. Um, so today we're going to talk a bit about migration, about some of the less common visitors that are found here in Marin, uh, some of the common species, and then we'll look at the habitats that they use and the ways that they go about securing prey and, and finding food. So today we're going to focus on the diurnal raptors, which basically just means day active. These are hawks and eagles and falcons and things like that, opposed to the nocturnal raptors which are owls. Um, and owls and, and hawks fill a similar ecological niche, but because they are active at different times within a 24-hour period, they're not directly competing with each other, so they're actually able to coexist. So in any given year in Marin, um, you could potentially see 19 different species of diurnal raptors. And um, some of these are quite common and in appropriate habitat, you would expect to see them. And some, we might not have any sightings in a particular year or just a handful. So if you notice, uh, the majority of these are broken into these four groups, the Budios, the Excipiters, the Falcons, and the Eagles, and we have some miscellaneous raptors. So let's, let's just look at these groups uh, first. And we have the Budios, which if you think of a red-tailed hawk, that's kind of a classic Budio. So they're the big soaring hawks. Um, they have wide, long wings and a fairly short tail. And you have eagles, which are even bigger. Um, these are really big birds. They have even longer wings. And if you look at the tips of their wings, they have long primaries, those feathers on the tips of their their wings are called primaries and they kind of look like little fingers sticking out. They also have fairly short tails and they have a much bigger head. They just have really big heads and with a, with a long neck and that really sort of stands out. The exhibitors are smallest hawks. They're, they're very small, um, you know, like a, a sharp shin hawk is about 
J size and the Cooper's Hawk is, is a bit bigger than that. Um, Shannon, those are the um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of people are commenting that your sound is going in and out a little bit. So I was wondering if you could just um, get the mic maybe a little closer to your mouth and maybe up the volume a little bit. Sure. Sorry, I got to interrupt. Oh no, I'm glad you did. Does that seem any better? Let's try that. I think it might be the, the relationship of the microphone to your, your mouth because it, it does go in and out, but I'm not entirely positive, but yeah, let's try that. Thanks. Okay. In the past when I haven't been using earbuds, so hopefully I can find a way to fix it. All right, let's try this. Thanks. Sure, thanks for letting me know. Um, okay, so the occipiters uh, have very long tails and they have short rounded wings. And uh, as I was saying, the shark shin hawk and cooper's hawk are really common hawks here during the uh, fall migration. And then falcons have very pointed wings and these are extremely efficient flyers. They're usually really pretty fast and they have sort of a, a, a longer tapered tail. But of all of these things, so what makes a raptor a raptor? Um, there isn't any distinct taxonomic grouping. So a lot of uh, birds that aren't necessarily closely related are considered raptors, but there are three characteristics that most of them share. And one is the bill, the shape of the bill. So they have a hooked bill with a really sharp tip to it. And so that allows them to break through the skin of animals, which in some cases can be pretty tough, and then to tear off pieces of meat. So most birds aren't capable of doing that. Uh, they also have incredible vision, just amazing vision. So if you look at the left side, this is a, a, a sort of drawing of an eagle eye, and then on the right side is the human eye. And one thing you note is the shape. So uh, first off, bird eyes are, are really large. So of all of the animals, birds have the largest eyes in relation to their body size. And then within the birds, the raptors have the most acute vision. Uh, so they really have good vision. So if you look at this, this eagle eye, one thing you'll notice is that it's sort of wedge shaped. And so the back is, is longer than the front is larger. And so that accounts for more uh, retinal area. And so if you think of rods and cones, they, that area is just packed with cones and cones absorb light and are responsible for uh, picking up color and all of that. And then the lens on the raptor eye is quite large. And like our lens, it can uh, move, it can adjust to focus. And the cornea is large and it also can move unlike the human eye. So they can really focus in and out. So if you look at this 2050 vision opposed to 2020 vision, what that means is that a raptor can see something from 20 feet away that a human would have to be five feet away in order to see. So uh, they can really pick up details and movement especially. So they can see a very small thing moving at a great distance. So the third thing uh, that differentiates raptors are they have really strong, powerful feet. And then they have these long, sharp talons. So the word raptor comes from the Latin word rapere, which means to seize or take by force. So that refers to the fact that they use their feet to capture, subdue, and hold on to their prey. And there are exceptions. So turkey vultures are kind of the exception to this. So they don't have really strong, powerful feet. Um, but the reason for that is because they're not capturing prey, right? They are scavengers, and so they're eating dead things. They're, they're already dead. They don't have to catch them. So they don't have these strong feet. And the taxonomy of turkey vultures has really been in flux. So at one point, they are considered more closely related to storks, actually. Now it seems that they are thought to be more closely related to raptors. Um, but there's, there's, there's some debate. So we'll see going forward where they land. But no matter uh, how you classify them, they are a good bird to become familiar with if you're looking at raptors. They're kind of the first thing that you should learn. So there are these, if you look up in the sky and you see a large soaring bird, your first question should be, is it a turkey vulture? And um, they're, they're mostly black. They don't have feathers on their heads. And so the adults have this nice red head, with a white bill. 
And the reason why they don't have feathers is because they eat carrion, so it's more hygienic to not have feathers. Another thing to note is that they've got, they hold their wings in sort of a, a raised V. So their, their wings are held slightly up and that's called the dihedral. So they have a fairly strong dihedral. So if you think of V for vulture, that's a good way to remember that. The juveniles don't have a red head and a white bill. It takes, they, they acquire that through their first year or so. Um, this one has a little bit of a feather stuck on its bill, but it has this grayish head. And then they are masters at conserving energy. So because they are dependent upon finding carry-on, which can be few and far between, um, they really have to conserve their energy. And so at night, they lower their body temperature. They purposely reduce the body temperature. And then in the morning, a lot of times you see them doing, they, they hold this posture. So what they're doing is they're putting their back to the sun. On their back, they've got all of these little capillaries. And so those warm up and then circulate through the body and help elevate the body temperature. So uh, just here's a nice photo of a tricky vulture compared to red-tailed hawk. You can see that they're bigger. Uh, the tips of their wings are, have those long primaries. And when their tail is folded, the tail looks kind of long. And because they don't have feathers on their heads, uh, they have these, their heads look pretty small in relation to their body. So on some of these, you can see they just kind of have this little triangular looking head. So a lot of times turkey vultures form what are called kettles. And so that, that name I think comes from, if you imagine a boiling pot of birds, right? It's sort of what it looks like. So you get all of these raptors circling in the sky. And a lot of times it's turkey vultures or mostly turkey vultures. But it's always good to, to look at these groups because sometimes you can have an eagle thrown in or some other interesting raptor. But a lot of different raptors will, will um, take advantage of what are called uh, uh, thermals, which we'll talk about in one second, and form these kettles of birds, these just sort of um, groups of birds that are that are turning in circles up in the sky. So what's going on here? So as the sun hits the surface of the earth, um, if it hits a forested area opposed to a grassland area, it's going to reflect heat differently. So it's, there's going to be more heat coming off of the, the grassy field than there is off of a wooded area, right? So just that difference in degrees can actually cause these columns of air that rise. And so what you get is it's warm at the bottom and heat rises. And so it lifts up, up, up high into the sky. And so birds can come in and kind of come in low and ride those currents all the way up into the sky without using hardly any energy at all. They basically just put their wings out. They don't have to flap. They can just um, soar and be lifted by those air currents up at the top it eventually cools down. And so at that point they're high in the sky and then they can just uh, glide out of that thermal and eventually gravity will bring them lower to the ground, but they can move great distances without using hardly any energy at all. So they can use this when they're hunting, if they wanna get up in the sky and look for food, or if they're moving from, let's say where their nest is to the area where they wanna forage for food or on migration, super important on migration that they, um, they're able to take advantage of these thermals and cover great distances without using up a lot of energy by flapping their wings and actively flying. Another thing that they take advantage of are called updrafts. So if you have wind coming up against a hill, when it hits, hits that slope, it pushes the air up and you get this pillow of wind. And so birds can take advantage of that. And a lot of birds will actually hang in the air in these places. Um, American kestrels are one that, are, that frequently do it. And here's a, a male American kestrel. And he's doing what's called kiting. So basically that pillow of air is suspending the bird and it barely has to move at all, just kind of slightly adjusts its tail feathers and its wing feathers, um, but they can just be suspended in air again without using much energy. And they can look for prey on the ground that way. So red-tailed hawks also do this. You can see this one is just kind of hanging there looking down at the ground. And these updrafts happen along the coasts and along our ridgelines. And if you think of California, most of our mountain ranges um, go from north to south. So birds that are migrating can take advantage of these updrafts and basically just ride that pillow of air along the tops of ridges as they're migrating. Okay, so let's talk about migration. So uh, migration is the movement of an individual from its breeding grounds away from its breeding grounds to some other and then back to those breeding grounds. So typically these are annual movements or well, seasonal movements over the course of the year. 
So how do birds migrate? Um, one thing is in the fall, there's this uh, thing called Zugenruha, which is a German word that, that means migratory restlessness. And so they, they basically can't, can't sit still, right? They just they get really antsy and they want to move. And so that kind of creates the impulse to migrate. Before they migrate, they accumulate flat fat. So they eat a bunch and they store that fat anywhere they can in their body. I mean, even on their, their heart, any organs, they just pack it in wherever they can because as they're flying, they're going to burn off a lot of that fat, right? So they want to accumulate that fat before they get, get headed out. And then on migration, um, they, they have basically an internal compass is, is the way a lot of people think of it. And there are two things that are primarily responsible for that. So one is something called magnetite, which are these little crystals that are um, found in the outer layer of the bill. And it actually helps the birds to sense the strength of the poles. So they can tell how close to the North Pole they are or how close to the South Pole or anywhere in between. So that helps them sort of, sort of place themselves um, along their migratory route. And then there's also something called cryptochrome, which is a protein that is found in the retina of the eye. And it's thought that this actually um, sort of adds a filter where they're actually visually seeing magnetic fields, which is really interesting. So as they're moving, they can um, get a, a sense of direction. They can actually tell what's north and what's south. So why do birds migrate? Migration is really risky, right? Uh, they can starve along the way. They can uh, have freezing storms that they run into. They can run into buildings or cars or, or be eaten by something else. So it's risky. But if you look at the world, the majority of the land masses are in the Northern hemisphere, right? Uh, above the equator. And then at the equator, you have consistent day length. Uh, the days and the nights are about the same length and the temperature is pretty mild year round. There is a, a constant availability of prey. There aren't really booms of prey, but you have this constant availability. And then if you look in the Northern uh, latitudes, they have really harsh winters, right? But during the summertime, the days are super long. And what that means is that you get a lot of prey. So you get these short periods where you get a huge concentration of prey. What that means is that these birds can actually support more offspring. So reproduction is kind of the whole point of, uh, you know, the, the drive of a lot of animals. And so they can take advantage of these areas and have, have more young. But then in the winter, they need to leave. And so if they migrate south, then they can take advantage of the habitat there. So they're actually getting the benefits of both of these locations by migrating. And in Marin County, this is a great place to observe the raptor migration that happens. So as birds are moving, they're coming kind of down along the coast and they don't really like to fly over water. As I mentioned, they take advantage of thermals, which really only, um, occur over land masses, they don't occur over water. And then also these updrafts they can take advantage of. So they try to avoid flying over water. So as they're coming down, they're following the coast. And so to on the east side of the county, they kind of get funneled down. And then any birds that are, or sorry, on the west side, any birds that are coming down on the east side hit the bay and then they're gonna wrap around. So they end up getting concentrated through Marin and especially down in Southern Marin, and the headlands is Hawk Hill, if anybody isn't familiar with that. Um, the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory is a fantastic organization. And um, that is located down at the very, very south uh, tip of Marin. So these birds get concentrated over that tip before they fly across the span, basically kind of where the Golden Gate Bridge is. Um, so that's a great spot to go look at birds. And about 30,000 birds move through there annually or are counted annually. Um, so... A lot of birds are doing long distance migrations. And uh, we were looking at that map of the world which showed the different flyways. So we're along the Pacific flyway. So uh, the broad winged hawk is one species that has a long migration. And the birds that move through Marin actually are coming from Alberta, Canada. For the most part, this is an Eastern bird. The blue is uh, their breeding grounds. And then the orange is where they spend the winter. And then the green and yellow are migration. So they're moving through here. And then um, they overwinter down in some in Mexico, some in Central America, but a lot of them in South America. But they get funneled through this area um, in Mexico, Veracruz, Mexico. And this is what the skies look like on the fall migration. It's 
called the Rip River of Raptors. So about a million broad wings move through and, or sorry, about 2 million broad wings and about a million species hopped. And so that's the, pretty much the entire world population of both species are moving through this area. So if you, if you ever want to see a lot of hawks, go down to Veracruz Mexico during the uh, migration. So Broadwing hawk that, that I've been talking about is a complete migrant out of North America. The entire population leaves North America um, and goes and winters south. And this is what the adults look like. Kind of nondescript on the underside, but it has a dark, dark uh, border around the wings and then this nice white band in the tail. And then the Swainson's hawks are the, the super long distance migrants. These guys are really impressive. So they can go all the way from Alaska down to Argentina, which is uh, 12,000 plus miles. And um, they, again, are also moving through Veracruz, Mexico, Mexico, as I mentioned. And they, for the most part, are complete migrants out of North America. Um, but a couple of them, which I'll talk about in a minute, remain uh, in the Central Valley. So, this is what the Swainson's hawk looks like. And it's got these really dark flight feathers against this light colored body. Um, and it's the only budio that has the, the flight feathers are this dark. And ospreys are kind of similarly uh, patterned, but their shape is very, very different, which we'll look at in a minute. So Swainson's hawks are birds of prairies and grasslands, and they breed in areas like this. And I think it's so interesting that a lot of these birds are overwintering in areas that have very similar habitats to where they're breeding. So again, this is the breeding area. And then they go down to Argentina and they overwinter in an area that looks pretty much identical, pretty much the same habitat, right? So a lot of them are going down to uh, La Pampa in Argentina, and they're actually taking advantage of lots and lots of grasshoppers that are down there at this time of year or at that time of year. Um, so during the breeding season, they're eating rodents and things like that. But in the winter, they're really subsisting on um, insects, for the most part, grass, uh, grasshoppers. And another uh, sort of colloquial name for them is the grasshopper sparrow. So we have them breeding in the Central Valley. And um, it's interesting, there's a population that overwinters in the Central Valley, but it's not necessarily the birds that breed there. Their, their geographic origin is unknown. But I do want to point out that um, they have this dark morph. And so if you go to the Central Valley to look at Swainson's hawks, a lot of them just look like big brown birds like this. Um, so a lot of our, our budios have what's called the dark morph. And that just means that their body feathers and the undersides of their wings are a lot browner than normal. So here's a dark morph red-tailed hawk. And here's a typical red-tailed hawk, a light morph that has more of this kind of buffy color on the chest. Um, and when you have dark morphs, you can have breeding pairs where you can have a light morph and a dark morph that are breeding. And then their offspring uh, can either look like one or the other parent or can have characteristics of both. So from one nest, you might have some young that are just typical light morphs and then some that are that nice chocolatey brown. But uh, isn't this a gorgeous picture of a, of a red tail? Uh, anyway, no matter what they look like, Red-tailed hawks tend to be short distance migrants. So they either move, you know, maybe a couple hundred miles at most, um, or they are residents and remain in areas year round. So here in Marin, they, have, they are year round residents. So they breed here and because it's warm enough, because there's enough food, it's just not worth the risk of migration. Um, so, so natural selection kind of predisposes them to not move around. But you might have birds from way up north that do what's called leapfrogging. So they might actually pass through here on migration and end up going farther south. And then you have some that are going to come and spend the winter here from elsewhere. And that's the case with a lot of our birds. Um, so during the winter time, we get a lot of different species that are coming from elsewhere, or different individuals, I should say, that are coming from elsewhere and spending the winter here. Um, and we have a lot of different habitats in Marin, and a lot of these birds are associated with particular habitats, so they can take advantage of those on migration or during the winter time. And so this uh, variability of habitats mean that we have a lot of different raptors that, that uh, we can get here in the county. So one bird that comes here and spends the winter here, doesn't breed here, is the Ferruginous hawk. This is a beautiful hawk. This is one of my favorites. Um, 
Ferruginous means uh, rust colored. And so it has this beautiful kind of orangey rust color on it on the adults. And this is the largest uh, hawk, the largest budio in North America. This is where they breed. They breed in, in the Great Plains and in grassland areas like this where they eat ground squirrels, prairie dogs, things like that. And then some of them come and spend the winter here in Marin in areas that look like this. So again, very similar habitats to where they're breeding. And, uh, so if you're lucky enough, if you head out to Point Reyes, it's throughout the county pretty much if you wanna look for a Ferruginous hawk in the winter, Point Reyes is the place to go. Um, and the juveniles are these big, mostly white birds. They have a little bit of a little comma, that black comma near their face, uh, but big, beautiful birds. And then the adults have this great uh, rust color and dark legs. Notice the legs on these. So the reason why their legs look so dark and in flight that really stands out is because they have feathers all the way down to their feet. And most of uh, the, the other hawks here don't. This is red-tailed hawk. You can see it has bare legs. But rough-legged hawks also have feathers all the way down to their feet, which is where the name comes from, rough-legged hawk, right? Because they've got feathered legs. And so this adaptation is really helpful if you spend a lot of time perching in the snow down on the ground, uh, which these guys do. So um, rough-legged hawks breed up in uh, northern latitudes and uh, things like uh, the Arctic tundra, and they, for the most part, build their nests on cliffs and things like that. So here's this great nest looking over the tundra. And uh, you can see there aren't a lot of trees. So sometimes they'll actually use caribou bones in their nests. So they breed in areas like this, and then they come and overwinter in areas that look, again, very similar. So this is Sassoon Marsh. We get rough-legged hawks that pass through the county on migration, but in Marin, not, not many stick around through the winter, but just east of us, you can go see them. And they have these really distinct carpal patches and the, the juveniles and the females have a dark belly band. So they're really distinct looking. And then American kestrels are here year round, uh, but their numbers swell in the winter time. And I wanna point out that this is a, a female on the left and a male on the right, and they have what's called sexual dimorphism. So in all raptors, the females are significantly bigger than the males. And it's not super obvious in this photo, uh, but the female is bigger in the species as well. And then also they, the, the kestrels have different plumages of the males and females. So a lot of the other raptors that we have, the males and the females pretty much look the same, but there's a difference in size. And um, so they do breed here, but we get a lot that come here in the winter. And there's just sort of this interesting thing about their winter habitat. So the females tend to overwinter in grassland open areas, like in this photo, what would be in the distance. And then the males tend to overwinter, their winter territories are in more um, bushy areas, shrubs or with trees and things like that. And the grassland areas are, are better territories. It's easier to find food. You can find food faster and there's less risk of predation. So something like a Cooper's hawk were to swoop in um, in a grassland and open area, the bird would be able to see that predator coming, whereas in a wooded area, a Cooper's hawk could sneak up on a kestrel uh, more easily. So it was originally thought that, um, that because the females are bigger, they're more aggressive, and they're sort of, they chase the males out of the better habitats in the winter. But it turns out that the females are actually arriving earlier than the males. So they arrive first, they pick the better territories, and then when the males show up, they're left with this, the, you know, if they can find a grassland area, then that's great. But otherwise, they'll end up in these more wooded areas or shrubbed areas. Um, but why? Why are the females showing up earlier? So it turns out that uh, it's because of molt. And so when they're molting their feathers. So the female incubates the eggs, and then once the, the eggs hatch, she's staying with the young for a while. So that's several weeks. It's, you know, over a month. And during that time, the male is feeding her. So he's busy flying around and catching food and feeding her. Once the eggs hatch, he's helping to feed the young. And so while the female is just sitting on the nest, she takes advantage of that. She goes ahead and she molts her feathers. So she's got fresh feathers for her migration. And then the male kind of has to uh, delay his molt until once he's done with all of that that uh, energy that he's using to support the female and the young. So he ends up finishing his molt a little bit later, which puts him arriving on the wintering grounds about a week or so later. So in a lot of cases, uh, the females have already chosen the territories and the males 
the males uh, kind of lose out because they're such great dads. Um, so these guys eat a lot of insects. They'll take small, small animals, but they also eat a lot of insects. So here's a male with a Jerusalem cricket. You can see the male's got this nice red tail with a black border. And then the female has a, a brown tail with uh, sort of thin bands. And here she's going after a dragonfly. So dragonflies um, are also migratory and they follow similar pathways that the birds follow. And so things like merlins actually uh, are another falcon. So I don't know if I mentioned this, the kestrels are our smallest falcon. And then merlins are also a small falcon. Um, and they take advantage of dragonflies. So while they're migrating and the dragonflies are migrating, they catch a lot of them. And which is no small feat because dragonflies are, are very maneuverable in the air. Uh, but for the most part, Merlins are eating birds. They're, they're really specialized in birds, and in particular in the wintertime, shorebirds. And so shorebirds are migrating, and the merlins follow those same patterns of migration and um, end up in places like this. This is a cemetery marsh at, on the Rush Creek Preserve. And so this is a snag that quite frequently in the wintertime, you can see a merlin perched in overlooking the wetland where lots of shorebirds are foraging, right? So they can take advantage of that. Um, so let's talk a bit about how all of these guys are capturing prey. So merlins are super fast. They've, they're uh, an, a falcon, so they've got these really pointed wings and they're really good at chasing birds down. And a lot of times, usually they start off from a perch and then they just swoop in really quickly and chase down a bird. But in some cases, especially in the winter and with shorebirds, they'll do this surprise attack. So they'll fly below the tree line, close to the ground where it's difficult to see them and then suddenly have the element of surprise when they come upon a group of birds. And then the peregrine falcon um, is this big, fast, really uh, you know, uh, adept flyer. And I feel like when a bird sees the silhouette of a peregrine falcon, it must be like a human um, swimming, suddenly seeing the fin of a shark something, you know, let's just put fear in their hearts. So peregrine falcons are incredibly efficient um, flyers, and they also specialize in birds. And so whether it's in the city and they're taking advantage of pigeons or um, in the winter, they also eat a ton of shorebirds. So they are known to be the fastest animal on the earth. And in a dive, they can get up to about 250 miles per hour, which is just nuts. So what they do is they gain altitude, they get up really, really high. And then if they spy something below them, um, they sort of do this roll and they turn themselves into a bullet. Basically they tuck their wings in and they're completely aerodynamic and they just plummet. But it's interesting because the way that the, their eyes are placed in their head, they can see things at a 40 degree angle. Um, the best is the, the best acuity. So if they were to hold their head at an angle like that, it wouldn't be aerodynamic, there would be drag, right? So instead what they do is they actually fly with their head straight, but as they're stooping, as they're diving and sort of falling, they do this spiral. So they're actually in this, this, um, this very tight spiral as they're coming down so that they can keep their eye on the prey. And then boom, they just run in or fly in and you get this explosion of song, or uh, sorry, shorebirds. And um, so a lot of times you see this on the, the left, high in this photo is the peregrine falcon coming in and all of the shorebirds just, just freak out and start flying. So they try to stay together as a group, but if one turns left, when the rest turn right, that's gonna be the one that the peregrine falcon goes after. And then there's some debate as to whether or not they ball up their fists and, and hit the birds in the air, or if they actually grab and release them. And so. Uh, researchers have looked at uh, videos and looked at them in slow motion, and it seems like they they grab them. And in some cases, they're going so fast that they just don't catch them. But that impact can stun a bird, and so it ends up tumbling down. So the exceptor is also specialized in eating birds, and the sharp shin hawk and the cooper's hawk are both exceptors, and they look really similar. One thing to note on the the adults have gray backs and sort of reddish fronts, whereas the juveniles are more brown all over. But on the sharp chin hawk, the back of the neck is all gray. They've got these skinny little legs. And on a cooper's hawk, uh, their head is sort of squarish and the back of their neck is light colored. And then they have heavier legs, if you can get a look at the legs. 
So the Cooper's hawk tend to, their center of gravity is down by their belly, whereas on a sharp shin hawk, it's up in their chest. So they look a little bit puffed out that way. And then if you look at the tail, the outer tail feathers on the Cooper's hawk are shorter. And on the sharp shin hawk, they're all the same. So the Cooper's hawk has a rounded look to its tail and the sharp shin hawk has a squarish look. And that shows up in flight as well. So this nice square tail on a sharp shin hawk and the elbows, uh, the wrists jut a little bit forward. Whereas on the Cooper's hawk, it's kind of a straight leading edge and then you've got that nice curved tail. So these guys um, are forest birds and they spring off of a branch. They're kind of ambush hunters. So they're sort of sprinters rather than long distance. So they push off incredibly uh, fast. And then they've got this long tail, short rounded wings, and they can maneuver through branches just, just insanely. They pull in those wings and they just kind of tuck them in and then their tail acts as a rudder. But this is dangerous, just going at high speeds through branches um, people have looked at the skeletons of these birds and seen that they have healed over fractures in their chest, especially their wishbones. So it's kind of amazing. They, they can break those bones and uh, survive, heal, and, and live to hunt another day. So they're highly maneuverable. They can zig and zag when their prey zigs and zags. And then ultimately, uh, they kill birds by squeezing them with their talons. So they capture them with their long toes, and then they squeeze and release. If the bird is still struggling, they squeeze again. So for the most part, they eat birds, but they can also take other small animals, like here's a little pink rabbit, um, opposed to northern harriers that for the most part are taking small mammals, but occasionally take birds. And northern harriers have this adaptation that is uh, really cool. Like owls, they have what are called facial discs. So there are these feathers that sort of circle the eye area. And what that does is it actually directs sound to the ears, which are right behind the eyes. And so they course low over fields. They used to be called marsh hawks. And they're not only looking for prey moving, but they're actually listening. So they have, uh, the, their hearing is similar to that of owls. They have fantastic hearing. And they have a few different plumages. So the juveniles um, have this nice pumpkin color. So in the, fall, or, uh, in the summertime and fall, you can see these orangey looking birds. And those are the juveniles. Again, they've got these really long, long wings and a long tail. The females are more brown and streaky. And then the males are, they sometimes are called gray ghosts. So they're really pale underneath, they're gray on the back, and they've got these nice black primaries that really stand out. But all of them have a white rump patch. So this can be really obvious, especially because these birds do spend so much time flying low, listening for prey, as well as looking, that you can spy this rump patch. And that, that's a great way to identify them. So another bird that spends a lot of time in marshes are white-tailed kites. And they really specialize in, I should say marshes and grasslands, um, they specialize in voles. And so they do what's called hover hunting. They sort of hang in the air and they flap their wings. Um, and what they're looking for is movement down in the grass. Voles tend to be above ground, moving through uh, grassland habitats. But these birds are also looking for uh, the ultraviolet ref reflection of vol urine. So that's actually a thing. Um, so vol urine is UV reflective. And so where it's concentrated, that suggests that that's a pathway that voles regularly use. So they'll keep an eye out for that and look for moving prey. Another specialist is the osprey that specializes in fish. And you can see this one is holding the fish head first, which they pretty much always do. It's more aerodynamic that way. So they always position the uh, fish like a, like a little missile underneath them. So osprey in the county here, um, they breed around uh, on Inverness Ridge, so around Tomales Bay and around our lakes. And they take advantage of snags and build these huge nests. They'll also take advantage of man-made platforms. And they hover hunt as well over water. And then when they come in at the last minute, they swing their feet in front of them to grab the fish. But if you've ever stuck um, like a, a stick in, in water, you, it looks like it's bending. So their brains automatically adjust for the contraction. And when the birds come in, they're actually coming in at a steeper angle than um, a, another raptor would if it were hunting something on land. So it's adjusting for that refraction and actually getting the fish where they actually are opposed to where they appear to be. And then they have these sharp, sharp, sharp talons and they also have um, a reversible outer toe. So bird feet, they, most, they have three toes faced forward and one back. And so they can swing 
their outer toe back to have two facing forward and two facing back, which is unusual for raptors. And then they have what are called spicules, which are modified scales um, that are really sort of rough. And so those help them to hold on to slippery fish. And there's one with a, a fish and you can see it sort of has this M shape when it flies in its wings. So another bird that eats a lot of fish are bald eagles. And they don't really care how they carry them because they're big, powerful flyers. Um, and so they are fairly gregarious. They will kind of uh, squabble a little bit and um, steal food from each other. But for the most part, they hang out together. They'll also steal fish from osprey. They'll chase them down and intimidate them until the osprey drops the fish. And it takes them a while to get that white head and white tail. So I just wanted to point out, this is a first year bald eagle and it's sort of got this really messy look. So it takes them about four or five years to get their adult. And then golden eagles, opposed to eating fish, really uh, prefer mammals. And so they take things like hares and rabbits. Um, they can even take livestock and, and undulates, larger prey, but for the most part, they're taking medium size. The adults have what's called a, a golden mantle. So um, that can really be evident and help you differentiate, differentiate between this and um, a young bald eagle, for instance. And then it takes them a few years to get their adult plumage. And when they're young, they've got these three points of light, two, two on their wings and one on their tail, the white spots. And I just wanna point out the difference between a golden eagle and bald eagle, these young birds, that the white is in different places on their wings and the black on the tail is, is stronger, cleaner on the golden eagle. So red-tailed hawks also eat mammals and they, are, they soar over fields in open places. And they'll also take advantage of other prey like bats. So if bats are emerging from a cave, they'll actually swoop in and try to catch them. Um, it takes almost a whole year for red tails to get that red tail. So it can be a little bit confusing their first year. The juveniles don't have a red tail, but you can see it's in, the adult and juvenile plumages, they've got this dark hood. And then they also have what are called patagial marks in both the juvenile and adult plumages, these dark crescents at the leading edge of the wing. So that's the best way to identify a red-tailed hawk. And then red shoulder hawks are, uh, the, the red-tailed hawks are probably the most common hawk in North America. And here in Marin, red shoulder hawks are probably the second most common. And opposed to soaring over fields, these are really perch hunters and they'll take advantage of urban areas, um, neighborhoods with trees and things like that. And they eat a lot of small animals, including uh, reptiles and things like that, and amphibians, I should say. Um, and here on the West Coast, we have a distinct uh, population that is really non-migratory. So on the, in the Eastern part of the country, they're migratory, but over here on the West Coast, they tend to be pretty sedentary. They're highly patterned, this great black and white patterning and really vocal. So if you have a hawk in your neighborhood that screams a lot, chances are it's gonna be a red shouldered hawk. And in flight, the, the light comes through the, the edges of their wings to form these sort of crescents. Um, and so that can be really obvious in flight. So um, we've talked about all of these different things that these birds eat and how they take advantage of different habitats and the different foods that they eat and the different ways that they acquire their food. And the young ones have to learn how to do this. Um, so I kind of just want to end by looking at a couple fantastic slides of handoffs between parents and juveniles. So here's a peregrine falcon. The adult is on the top and the juvenile is, is underneath and it's swooping up and the parent actually passes off food in the air. So these, like I said, eat a lot of birds. So it makes sense that they're passing them in the air. But other birds do this too. So here's a, a female Northern Harrier passing off a mouse to a juvenile Harrier who has flown up from underneath and basically has to turn upside down to catch it. So this is a way of the adults getting the, the, the young used to um, catching things that are moving. And here's a fantastic photo of a white-tailed kite passing off a vole to a juvenile. So the juvenile has this kind of rusty uh, area around the, the neck and the head. So right now, um, some juveniles are, have just left their nest and they're still begging, they're still calling to their parents. So you might hear some vocalizations and they're hoping to get, still get fed. Um, those are the late guys, but some are already on the move. So some are already migrating. Juveniles tend to be the first migrants before the adults. And so right now, if you're out and about, um, you might see some that are migrating, some that are just 
newly on their own and fending for themselves and some that are still get a little bit of help from their parents. But anyway, wish them luck. They've got, um, you know, an arduous year ahead of them to make it to adulthood. So I realized that that was a ton of information and hopefully your heads aren't spinning. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Shireen to see if anybody has questions. Hi, so thank you so much. That was fascinating. And you're right, there is a ton of information. I just wanna remind everyone that in the chat, I've put uh, the website for Marin County Parks. I've put Shannon's email, that's sburke at marincounty.org. Um, I've also put the Raptor, uh, Golden Gate Raptor Observatory website uh, in the chat in case any of you wanted to follow up on the suggestion of Shannon's to um, investigate that organization. I put a blog posting from on the Marin County Free Library website by a colleague of mine. It's all about bird watching. And I put my email, sash at marincounty.org, in case you have any follow up questions for me. So now let's get to your questions. Um, so the first question, Shannon, that you got is, how can you differentiate between dark morph red tails, Swainson hawks, and golden eagles? I think maybe you addressed some of this, but could you review that, please? Sure, so um, one thing to look for is the Swainson's hawks are going to have those dark flight feathers. So on a dark morph red tail, the flight feathers are usually still light. It's just the body feathers. So the flight feathers are the, the long feathers that are coming off of the wings and then uh, the tail too are also flight feathers. But if you look at those, those long feathers on the wings on, um, on a red tailed hawk, they're gonna be lighter than they would be on a Swainson's hawk. Also the shape of the wing is different. Um, I didn't wanna to get too deep into ID in this lecture, but the Swainson's hawks have really long tapered wings. So the shape of the wing is also different. And then a golden eagle is just going to be a bigger bird, a lot more solid in flight, longer wings. As I mentioned, the, the tips of their wings, their primaries, these little feathers are gonna be longer and then a much bigger head. Um, so it's kind of just a, a, something that it takes practice to get used to, but there are ways to differentiate. Sounds like some of it's comparison, seeing one against the other. Yeah, or just to sort of like getting us like, having, you know, having seen other birds to be able to compare them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and so the next question, question is, what is, uh, what is the size comparison? Is that the same? Yeah. It's, do you think you fully addressed this? It's the same three birds. What is the size comparison of a Swainson hawk, a uh, red tail and golden eagle? Yeah, so again, the Swainson's hawk is going to have like longer, more tapered wings. Um, so far as the weight, I'm not sure, but I think they might have a little bit of a lighter body. The, the um, red-tailed hawk is going to be um, a little bit sort of uh, stouter looking overall. And then the golden eagle is just much, much bigger. Thank you. How are raptors, particularly fish eating raptors, doing in the drought? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have any numbers. I don't actually know. Um, but you think about, yeah, some, some places where um, these raptors are dependent upon fish in lakes or reservoirs and things like that. And if those are drying up, obviously they're going to be impacted. Um, you know, if there's another body of water that's, that's close enough, raptors can, can fly pretty easily, you know, can cover several miles um, pretty easily. So for instance, like Osprey here, um, can easily move between the coast and the bay. So just to give you an idea. Thank you. A question, um, the next question is, do black hawks exist in Marin County? No. Okay, thank you. And a number of thank yous. Anyone else mm -hmm. have any questions? The thank yous are coming in. Great presentation, lots of detail, amazing presentation. Thank you, Shannon. Um, all very kind. Oh, uh, thank you for a fascinating event. I saw about 100 pelicans in the Los Galinas Sanitary District ponds a week ago. Do you wow. do? 
So do you do other local birds? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as uh, the migration season, so we're, we're just kind of on the, I should have mentioned this, we're just sort of at the beginning of migration um, and birds are just starting to move through and then um, that, that will continue for the next several months. So a lot of birds are moving through, not just raptors, raptors, shorebirds, um, you know, songbirds, all sorts of things are on the move and will be for the next few months. And then, um, so, so yeah, fall and winter and spring are all great seasons for bird walks. Um, so if you, if you come out on, on a walk with me, we'll probably be looking at birds any of those times. Sounds like a fun event to go out on a walk with you. Um, we have a question about gophers. We have a big field with lots of gophers. Why don't we have more hawks? We do have some, do they have territories? They do, yeah. So uh, during both the breeding season and the winter, these birds typically have, have territories. So during the breeding season, they definitely have territories. And let's say, so if you have a field of gophers, that would be a good spot for say a red-tailed hawk if there are uh, trees nearby that they could nest in. Um, and so you're going to have a pair and they, uh, you know, are going to be keeping tabs on anybody else that comes into that territory, especially another red-tailed hawk, and will sort of um, escort other hawks out of the area. So they definitely are territorial during the breeding season. And then a lot of these birds do, like I was mentioning, kestrels definitely have winter territories. Um, some of these birds do uh, have looser territories during the wintering season, during the winter as well. But. Thank you. How do scientists find the magnetite in their bills? Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. A lot of actually, a lot of different organisms actually have magnetite, including humans. We have it in our brains, and even bacteria do. Um, so I'm not sure if they're using you know, somehow um, if they're studying it, but use it basically using magnets to, to sense it, but because it does have that reaction. So I'm not sure how they tell. That's a fascinating thing to think about. Yeah. Um, a listener comments, we have lots of herons and we do have trees, which is where they land. Um, yeah, and so a lot of, so herons aren't raptors, um, they're, what's lumped into this group called wading birds. Uh, but uh, great blue herons and egrets actually will roost at night in trees. And then they also nest in trees. So, which is interesting. They're these big gangly birds you wouldn't think of as being in trees, but, but they do, they spend a lot of time in trees. A question I was wondering about too, is who did this amazing photography? Oh, thank you for asking that. And I, I forgot to mention that. Um, I grabbed all of these photos from online. I am not a photographer and I am so appreciative to people who take these amazing photos and put them online. And um, most of these are, uh, you know, uh, non-copyrighted, but hopefully any, anything that's slipped by me, people would be okay that I'm using it for educational purposes. But yeah, a big thanks to these people who take these gorgeous photographs. Yeah. Yeah, I was particularly impressed by the ones with the parent handing off food to the juveniles. Right? Yeah, yeah, it was kind of astounding. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have more questions? We're getting to the end of the hour. A comment. Do check out Clint Graves' instance in Beach. He is an amazing photographer. So Clint Graves, G-R-A-V-E-S, is a suggestion. I'm assuming he has a website. Most folks do. Nice. Any other questions? Well, I'll jump in with one I have. Um, it, over uh, above our yard, we often see um, a group of crows chasing a red tail. And I'm assuming that's about protecting their young. Is that right? Or is something else going on? Yeah, it's interesting. So when when birds uh, sort of uh, go after raptors and crows are known for doing it, it's referred to as mobbing. And there are a couple of different thoughts as to why birds do this. And um, so it might be that they are sounding the alarm so that their mate or their offspring is alerted. Uh, another thought is that it's sort of letting the predator know, hey, we see you, so you're not gonna be able to sneak up on us, so you might as well go somewhere else. 
Um, and another thought is that it might be attracting a larger predator to the, to the smaller predator, right? So let's say you have a um, sharp shin hawk and, and maybe a Cooper's hawk will come in or something like that, I don't know. But um, so it, it probably is a combination of all of these things. Crows in particular are sort of, they're just uh, prone to doing it and it seems a bit exaggerated in, in relation to the threat. So um, I don't know, I don't have a great answer as to why crows uh, are, are so vocal and get so upset about uh, different raptors, but they do. So if you ever see a bunch of crows basically cawing their head off and making a bunch of noise and diving on a tree, take a second look because there could be a, a hawk or even an owl in there. So they, they really help us humans find raptors. So that's a good service they provide. <laughs> a question here about turkey vultures. How do turkey vultures digest carrion? So they, um, for the most part, they're just, they're picking off uh, the meat just like other raptors do. And it's interesting, but, but meat is actually more easy to digest than vegetable matter. So um, cellulose is actually harder to break down. But uh, some of these birds are swallowing prey whole and they, most hawk, so, People might be familiar with owl pellets. So after they eat, they regurgitate fur and um, feathers and bones in what's called a pellet. So a lot of different birds actually cough up pellets and hawks do as well, all raptors do. And in hawks, typically they actually have strong enough digestive juices to break down a lot of the bones. So you don't get bones in their, their pellets. So turkey vultures um, aren't probably eating a lot of bones. They're probably in a lot of cases, um, they're they're eating carry-on and they're picking around the bones. Um, but if they did get bones, they would, they would just probably for the most part be breaking them down as well. Thank you. A question, I think a little bit more directed to me, does the Corte Madero Library work specifically with the marine birding population and specialize in raptors? Uh, no, <laughs> not necessarily, but we do really like to work. I really like to work with Shannon um, and the parks because uh, Shannon does amazing talks and, um, and the community really enjoys learning about the flora and fauna of Marin County. So um, it's a particular favorite of, of mine. Um, so, but no, we don't particularly work with birding populations and so forth. We're more of, you know, the book information kind of folks. Uh, but great question to ask. So it's 11.04. And I just want to do a final sweep, a final call for questions before we end the talk. And you can grab your binoculars and go out and look for some birds today. Sounds Our, like a good plan. I thought so. It's nice and clear <laughs> out, isn't it? All right. So I'm going to call it. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was a really instructional talk. Again, this is being recorded and will be posted on our website, our YouTube channel, so Marin County Free Library YouTube channel. It usually takes about two weeks to get up. If you have any questions, you can always email me and have a wonderful day watching birds or whatever it is all else you're gonna do. So enjoy and thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Shireen, and thanks everyone for joining. All right, bye everyone, have a great day.